You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larson on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Jerry Parker, Moritz Siebert, and I, Niels Kastroblasen, are delighted to be back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series. And as usual, we're going to discuss last week's events, but also the events of uh, the month of November in the world of rule-based investing and take some of your questions. So um, good afternoon to you, Moritz. Good morning to you, Jerry. How are things? Hello, Niels. Good. Yes, great. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Well, as I mentioned, it's uh, the end of another week, uh, but it's also the end of another month, which uh, certainly did not disappoint when it comes to the news flow and the action in the markets and the volatility that we've seen. So I'm sure we will have a few interesting things to uh, review and see how it all uh, played out for for us who operate in the systematic uh, investment world. So um, why don't we just uh, kick it off? Uh, I mean, I think uh, as, as, as for people who are listening to uh, our conversation each week, I'm sure it's no surprise that it was a difficult month um, and that, um, you know, CTAs, trend followers will be um, for the most part in the red. Uh, so not just red October, now we have red November. Uh, we'll have to put an end to these red months. But anyways, um, what did you guys uh, see, experience, what, what caught your eyes, what was interesting about uh, the month? Um, why don't we start with you, uh, Moritz? How, how, was, how was the month of November? Looking back uh, on the month, uh, a choppy month, uh, not as red as October, so more like a light red, minus one and a half <laughs> to minus two. Pink, pink November, maybe. Uh, pink, pink November, exactly. Um, Looking back on the past month, um, sure, we had the big move move down in oil. Um, I think yeah. we changed positions on the back of that, uh, maybe made some money there. Uh, we still had some PL coming from natural gas. That was good. But looking back on the last week, um, some losses from the equities, uh, like S&P Midcap, I remember with a long position that produced a loss, uh, heating oil and gas oil, those came down. Uh, lost on those 10 year notes in the US. Uh, wrong footed position there, produced some losses. But, you know, PL, good PL from Boons, from Silver, from 30 year bonds in Germany. So mixed back again. Um, and the week was a bit down only. But like you said, I mean, the month of November is, is down one and a half to 2%. Sure, 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 sure. What was, uh, what was it like for, for you, Jerry? Uh given your approach to things? Yep, my uh, long-term approach uh, looked very poor in the way that we handled the energy, crude, heating oil, unleaded. So that did not look uh, like we knew what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> I really prefer to go through the inventory of markets and positions and see if I'm still happy. And I am, I'm happy, except for that. Um, I think it's good to still be short uh, the grains, uh, metal, shorts, precious, and base look good. Long platinum, very happy with that. Uh, net gas, um, long and strong, ignoring the volatility totally, could care less. Uh, could turn into something really nice and big. Coffee kind of turned around, uh, and the dollar got some strength, almost back to the I looked it up June of 17 highs, so we're that's looking pretty good. Happy with my small commitment to interest rates uh, <clears throat> due to their correlation. And we got re rewarded a little bit and started purchasing some more uh, boring U.S. stocks, McDonald's, Walmart, th those kind of equities are making highs and still holding on to some tech companies or uh, non-boring companies, I guess, that uh, are still uh, in a decent uptrend. So, um, yeah, I wish I could have figured out a way to be long-term, and uh, which I think is sort of necessary, but keep more of the profit in a chart like uh, crude, which was just relentlessly down and uh, not happy with 
a performance of the way that, that our systems handled crude, but I guess it's kind of the way, the way it goes. Uh, if we change and try to maximize the crude uh, chart in that, that p- pattern, we may do damage in, in, in other markets in the future. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I hear you. It was, uh, it was a very unusual um, move in, in some sense and, and certainly caught the uh, trend followers on the on the wrong side of that uh, reversal um and so uh, i can i can uh acknowledge that as well and i think from from our point of view um it was pretty much all done by uh, november 1st i mean the, the the amount of money we lost on november 1 was really the amount of money we lost uh, for the whole month so kind of treading water with some volatility um for for the most part uh unlike you jerry we do have higher commitment to fixed income and that was really where we saw uh the losses the um you know the rally in in um, in us uh, fixed income you know from the Partly, I guess the the pressures uh, from from uh, around uh, the U.S. Uh, political circles to for the Fed to kind of uh, change the language a bit about you know where the neutral stance is on on rates, in which I guess Jay Powell came out on uh, Friday or Thursday, whenever it was, and kind of gave into that and said you know, we're getting closer. So that obviously helped fuel this. Uh, rally in U.S. Uh, bonds and short-term rates, and, and that was really where we saw most of our losses. Uh, like you guys, uh, lost money in energy, but it made up uh, for all of that in natural gas alone. So oil's down, but natural gas up, which which was kind of neutral, pretty neutral in, 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 um, in the FX sector for us. Um, and um, and maybe small gains in 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 stocks. Um, so our kind of short bias uh, in Europe um, being more short than than we are uh, long in the US uh, helped out a little bit. Uh, lost a bit in metals and um, grains was kind of mixed uh, in that sense with a few a few highlights. Uh, but overall, uh, another down month and um, and certainly in our case, um, you know, it's the, for our fully leveraged program. It's the thirteenth time now that we're in a drawdown larger than twenty five percent from a peak. Uh, our last all time high was in January, so certainly not the longest drawdown, but it's one of those um, periods where. Uh, where you uh, you know do get questions uh, from investors and and other observers about trend following and does it still work and uh, so it allows me at least to look back on the previous twelve times uh, we've been in this situation and um, this looks exactly like every other drawdown uh, of that size um, uh, from our point of view and and also um, you know the average uh, length of the drawdowns previously have been around uh, I think 11 months and uh, the recoveries on average have been 10 months we're right now in the 10th month of our drawdown so um, you know I let people make their own conclusions but as we all know with any investment strategy the best time to invest is at the bottom of a drawdown. So, um, so that's just how it all uh, plays out at the moment. Um, anything else that you uh, noted from from the market side? Uh, I didn't particularly notice any uh, sort of trend changes, except for energy, where we could probably say that there has been some change, at least in. In, in that in their fortunes but anything else that you noticed or, or should we um, jump straight in to listen to some of Jerry's uh, top tweets I found the uh, the move in the oil markets pretty interesting I must say I think last week uh, WTI dipped below 50 even mm-hmm. and when yeah. you look at that chart like WTI coming down real clean nice and clean you'd say that that's a very nice chart for a trend follower. And then looking at the PL, made some PL on WTI, but actually not that much. Which, mm. when you look at that chart, it's kind of like, you know, you scratch your head and go, why not? But it's just that's, that's the way it played out that way. Even lost some money on Brent. So that move looks real nice and clean on a chart. But, um, you know, when you go into the details, it wasn't that easy, at least. You know, for the way that I trade, it wasn't that easy to make money off that. Because... But maybe, maybe, maybe this is a good point just to stop for a second. I mean, we've had a big move and we've all, uh, you know, given back some of the, pro- I'm sure there's still profits in the uptrend left, but but we've certainly given back a, a big portion of it. But I mean, I'm sure a lot of people out there will think about, well, you know, 
couldn't you do better? And you kind of alluded to it, Jerry. I mean, you're not happy with the way it was done. But again, if you're going to change something, it might hurt all the other reversals we see. And, and maybe then energy doesn't work as well. But is this something, is this one of those um, points in time where you have a big you have a big market move and, and you kind of stop and, and take stock? And, 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 and how do you approach this thing about, you know, could I have done it any different or any better? I mean, how do we how do we think about that? If I can kick it over to you guys. I still need to do the analysis, to be honest, Niels. Um, and one of the things, you know, I, I kind of like the fact that doing those analyses, I, I take some time with that to distance myself from the market. So maybe that's one of the things that I want to have a look at, not right now, but in a couple of weeks time. Mm -hmm. um, when, you know, the, the news and the volatility of, of that move has maybe come to an end, maybe not, who knows. Yeah. But I will yeah. definitely have a closer look into that. I just um, haven't started with that yet. No. Most likely, um, it's not going to trigger any changes uh, to the way sure. I trade. Actually, I'd be very surprised if it did. Um, yeah. It's just one of those moves that happened in the way it did. And um, well, there you go. Like I said, I mean, it didn't, didn't lose money. It, it made some money, but not as much as you'd think. No, it's kind of that worst thing where you gave up. You give up a lot of your, a lot of your open profit. Um, what are the conversations right. you're having with your team, uh, Jerry, on on this topic, or is it just something you're formulating within yourself at this stage? It's pretty much uh, everything about the trade. It's bad. Mm. It stinks totally. Um, I think it's just one of those things that if you really wanted to nail the trade, you had to get flat and short pretty pretty quickly and close to the highs which is a losing strategy from, I can't make that strategy work on all of the markets. Uh, I had a paranoia last week when we were talking, it was fake. It was the CTAs, but now it's so relentless and it's going down. Now we kind of know it's kind of real. So that's okay. That's cool. At least yeah. it wasn't a pretend I'll go searching for my stops uh, type of a situation. It's Saudi Arabia, being punished yeah. or Saudi Arabia doing some punishing. I, I don't know. Yeah. But, or giving uh, it the world a gift. Yeah, giving giving us, the, that's right. You know, yeah, trying to make up gift. for yeah. some of their misdeeds yeah. or whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, you're know, getting out of the long, uh, that was messy, uh, relentless. It reminds me of a, you know, of a handful of trades we've had this year or the past year. Uh, just a relentless sell-off. And, you know, the whole point of being longer term is – you're going to stay short coffee. It's going to rally like hell, and then you're still short some, let's say. And mm. this is what the historical data says. Eh, hang in there. And yet sometimes it just rallies, you know, or it just uh, breaks, and there's no stopping it. Uh, in the short trade, I mean, that's no good either. It's uh, usually you get uh, some um, reduction of vol, and you can put on a bigger position. You see some choppiness. No, it's just, just a V top straight to, into a short. Uh, the positions are small uh, because the vol is so high, at least for me. And so the short's not going to be any good. <laughs> I'm going to get just yeah, whipsawed yeah. and I got a small position on. And I think it's one of those trades that if it goes to zero, which I don't think crude will go to zero, but if it does, I don't, my, my totally maximum profit that I can make in the trade is smallish. It's one of the mm. advantage. It's one of the things we kind of know in a short, um, I guess it can go negative, and I guess rates can go negative. I just assume they probably won't. So it would be nice, though, if people would pay us to put gas in our cars, wouldn't <laughs> <That's>, it? <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> Yeah, no, I hear you. I think it's uh, I think it's interesting, and I think again, you may know, the, all three of us are you know diversified in our approach, and this is just one of those situations where, again, it proves the point about you know diversification and the importance of diversification, and uh, you know let's not fall in love with one position or even one sector, and 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 these things uh, you know change over time, um, so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I mean, we, we should hear about your tweets, Jerry, but before we do that, and maybe that's something you've been tweeting about, but did one of you share an article with me or vice versa this week about, um, I think there was an article about, you know, the year where nothing worked and there was like 70 markets they had followed and none of them had made money or something like that. Does that bring a bell? Yes. Have you seen that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I tweeted that. Um... Okay. 
uh, from a person who I think tweeted it from someplace else. Anyways, it's out there, and it uh, basically it's my tweet, my copy paste was by one measure, global stocks and bonds are both on track to finish the year in the red for the first time in at least a quarter century. That's right. Ninety percent yeah. of the seventy asset classes tracked by Deutsche Bank are posting negative total returns for the year, the highest share since 1901. Not sure if any of that's true, if you know, it feels like it, but I know that we think that we're not going to be as subject to that sort of stuff because we're trading uh, more than stocks and bonds and we're trading them uh, currencies and commodities short and as well. So, um, bummer. We're not, we're not yeah. doing too much. But this is where it gets interesting, in my opinion, right? Because you, you, as, as you quote, I mean, this might be the first year in a long time where both equities and bonds will finish in the red. And I think that's one thing a lot of investors may have forgotten. And, and I know we've talked about it on this series uh, before, but the correlation between these two asset classes have been very different in the last 10 years than they have been historically. And, and this is an example of that, actually, that you have positive correlation, meaning they're both you know, going to potentially end down for the year, and 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 clearly, a lot of portfolios uh, are not really set up for that. Um, so, uh, you know, interesting to to see uh, what what happens and what decisions as investors are looking into 2019, and you know, they have to make some decisions about their strategic asset allocations. You know, is this something that's going to play into that? Uh, so. Um, so we'll see. I think it's interesting. Let's stay with the tweets, uh, Jerry. You probably got a few other good ones that uh, had some good traction, reaction. Oh, correction. They're all good. Um, I like them all. Of some of course. my favorites got no interest from followers, but uh, some did. And uh, yeah. This one, uh, one I like is uh, probably the most popular. Had nothing to do with trading. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Although, in my mind, everything has something to do with trading. And um, it was just a random article I found and uh, kind of interesting. And the quote is, to look good for college, parents don't want their kids to work dead-end summer jobs like they did. <clears throat> Those discomforts play a large role in the desire to earn unusual success later. The biggest obstacle for most great stories to ever begin is comfort. So I f uh, that hit a note with people. Um, yeah. Getting comfortable with discomfort was another quote, which I think, uh, you know, we're always raising children and uh, thinking that their goal and our goal is not to suffer, not to have discomfort, not to do hard things. And yet we kind of know that when that's happened in our life, historically, we think we look back fondly that it's shaped us and made us who we are. And um, I think it certainly <clears throat> is appropriate for trading to embrace those drawdowns and face to, embrace the discomfort. It's part of the system. We should love the system, everything about the system. It's drawdowns. It's bad Novembers. It's bad 2018s. And uh, because it's part of the whole process that we feel like that historically has been profitable. And we certainly believe in the future to be profitable. And, um, I think it's dangerous to try to separate the uncomfortable periods, the periods we're not happy with, the crew trade. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to make our bottom line to get rid of that that uh, bad uh, experience we had, but to embrace the whole process that we think is a totally winning process. People liked it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. It, it certainly, uh, yeah, I, I did notice that uh, tweet, and I thought it was very interesting. Do both of you remember your first your first job? Sure. What did you do, Mort? I was carrying papers um, at the age of 14, 15. That was kind of like the first uh, the first job, summer job that I took. And it was very early in the morning, like uh, 4 a.m. You had to get out on the bike and uh, pick up those papers and drive them around. Um, you know, took until 7 o'clock in the morning. So for a young teenager, that's an early time to get up. But uh, it earned me some money. And then, you know, every summer since I've done summer jobs in, you know, different industries, construction, things like that. Sure. Um, sure. But it's been uh, part of uh, part of the process. And my parents, they've always insisted uh, on that and said, you know, do it. 
um, they didn't say it's good for you. It's just kind of like, you know, Hey, uh, you have summer vacation, this, uh, you know, don't just hang out in front of the TV, get something done, earn some money, that type of spirit. Sure. Sure. What about you, Jerry? What, what was your first job? I think my first job was at my father's gas station. So it mm. gave me lots of time to contemplate that I did not want to work this hard, be out in the cold mm. weather. Uh, so I had a lot of motivation and uh, time to think about the future. And if I know at least once or twice, I probably went to my father and said, hey, I think I might want to get another job for the summer or something. And I think he just kind of laughed, you know, that was just not going to be possible. So it was, you know, it was a fond memories now at the time, you know, I definitely was motivated to avoid, uh, try to, you know, get out and do something more fun and more creative, obviously. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. How about, my, how about you? My own, yeah, exactly. My own experience was that, uh, I got a job at a book shop. Um, and I thought that's great that, you know, even though I wasn't that interested in books, but I thought it was, you know, pretty cool until they told me that my job for the summer would be to be in a basement all summer and essentially open cardboard boxes with all the books for the, for the local schools. So I had to open these boxes. I had to take all the books out. I had to count them to check that it said it was the same number of books as it said on the label and then put them all back. <laughs> so, so that was a long summer and didn't pay very much, but it was a good experience for sure. <laughs> um, what other tweets did you have, Jerry? That was a nice little yeah. change of topic. Yeah. So I was, there's a lot of good stuff, kind of funny. Uh, Goldman Sachs came out and said, um, with a chart I tweeted showing that commodity prices are in a big, huge downtrend. So their, their opinion is, okay, so let's get uh, interested maybe in getting long in 2019. I hope they're mm -hmm. right about that. Um, Cliff asked this had a funny interaction on Twitter, got angry oh, yeah, and upset, that, yeah. uh, told one of his clients who he's, I guess he's mad at on Twitter, please redeem now as I find posturing fools in our funds beyond concerning. Bye bye. Hashtag blocked because I was blocked by him as well. So, uh, but you know, I've definitely felt the same thing. You just get frustrated with people and you're, and even if they're your clients to question and to not hang in there like you hope they would. So, um, anyways, just thought it was kind of humorous, sure. great guy. Made some headlines. Yeah. yeah. Made some headlines. Yeah. Sure. Funny guy, but, um, then more substantive would be, uh, got a lot of interest in, uh, a couple of quotes from, Aspect Capital People. Uh, the headline is Aspect Won't Tinker with CTA Strategy Despite October's Slide. Quote, constantly looking back at past performance, <clears throat> looking in the rearview mirror, adjusting the model is a prime way of destroying value for investors. CTA strategies are now firmly on investors' radar screens. Yes, CTA returns are bursty. Never heard of that before. They're unpredictable. <laughs> They're highly episodic like that. Right. But it's important to be able to take a long-term perspective and not try and time the sector. And I really like that. Um, uh, yeah, not tinkering. I mean, I think over the years I have tinkered and I wish I hadn't tinkered. And then sometimes I didn't tinker and I had to go back, uh, you know, in the future and had to figure out, well, I should have tinkered. So I think that's really the key is to find, I know we want our clients want us to evolve. Markets are changing, quote unquote. Um, yeah, I think it's important to figure out what to change and what doesn't change. Diversification, longs and shorts, never changes. Not for me. Price only, not going to change. Uh, you know, so there is some givens. There's the 10 commandments of trend following or of my trading. And then, um, uh, but you have to be a little smarter and figure out what do I t tinker with? What do I don't tinker with? And I really like what Moritz said, which is I may uh, look at, I think I should look into uh, this hurtful period where my pride has been hurt in a couple of weeks or a month or two when I maybe have a clearer head. Yeah, no, I think time will certainly uh, always be a, a, a friend uh, and, and, you know, to help us uh, get a bit more dispassionate about uh, what's, uh, what's going on. But, um, you know, Aspect's been around for a long time, of course, and uh, I think we all uh, echo those, um, you know, those sentiments, uh, really. So nice to 
nice to see that out there and and I do feel for some reason I don't know um but but I certainly feel that um the investor interaction that I have on on my side uh, you know people are very understanding and you know appreciate the fact that uh, you know we're not the ones who should be changing our minds about what we do um you know just because there's a bad month or a bad period I mean it's you know, it's important. They may have discretionary traders in their portfolio already that might be, uh, you know, uh, changing uh, much more frequently. Um, but having some kind of anchor in your portfolio where you know that it's a process and it's really the process they buy, not not only the returns, but it's the process they buy is, you know, is is, is cool and, and they're, they're okay with that. What other interesting tweets did you, um, did you share this? This past week, Jerry, uh, my followers really, and me too. We, I, we enjoy Daniel Kahneman. He has lots of good things oh, to yeah. say. Um, a lot of tweets there. Uh, how important it is to follow a system. Um, intuition should be avoided. Um, in uh, this was a sort of an interesting, uh, kind of funny thing he said. Uh, Having been successful is not a guarantee of future success but it's almost always a guarantee of future overconfidence. So everywhere you look, uh, we're, I'm trying to find always reasons to, little quotes like that or reasons to con continue to um, convince myself and others that, you know, following a system is where we need to, what we need to concentrate on and not relying upon our experience or our confidence. Um, and this one hit home <clears throat> pretty this is really a good quote. Uh, there is inconsistency in judgment, not only between people, but within a person on different occasions. They will make di on different occasions, they'll make different judgments. That instability of judgment is large enough to make algorithms superior to people. Um, mm. Algorithms should be used wherever possible. And I think that's when we talk about discipline and following our systems. This is the heart of what we're talking about is that every situation, every time our entry and exit points or we're measuring it in the crude market and all of these different charts and different markets. We're going to do the same thing every time. We're not going to make different judgments on different occasions. We're going to handle every situation the same. That's why I think it's so important to make as few changes in those areas as possible. If you're not going to trade cocoa, then fine, kick it out. Don't put it back in. If you're going to take it, if you're going to trade it, keep it in and trade it the same way each time, the same Unit size, the same entry, the exit. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I have to evolve, yes. And so I will evolve a little bit. And in my case, maybe become a little longer term many years ago, but maybe hopefully I won't have to make another change. I think this uh, <clears throat> making these different, uh, ch having these different strategies or slightly different ideas and constantly evolving and changing, it just introduces uh, a lack of consistency. Uh, and I think... Um, yeah, I really like that quote. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I think I like, I mean, I also like what you said before, actually, and this is the thing about, you know, there are certain things like your 10 commandments or, you know, there are just certain things that doesn't change. It doesn't mean we can't evolve, but it just means that there are some principles that we're never going to break. And, um, and, and that's your, that's your, you know, that's the foundation. Yeah. How about you, Moritz? Did you did, did that hit a chord as well? <laughs> yes, and uh, you said it so perfectly, Jerry. There's nothing to add from my side. I agree with all of that. Yeah. So once I see that Kahneman has been out there and he's given a speech, I'll just start trying to find articles, you know, different quotes, different ways that different things he says. Everyone kind of takes a different uh, part of what he said and puts it in an article. And uh, so not to overdo it, but he, another one of the articles about him was entitled human intuition and investing is a dangerous cocktail. Uh, the advantage of algos is you give them the same information twice. You will get the same answer back each time. People are not like that. So say, saying about the same thing, but I think that's the secret of what we do. You know, we're going to continue to do it the same way every single time. Uh, we sold crude in 2014 at 90. It may have been our fourth or fifth time going short, <clears throat> but we're just going to keep on selling that breakout and doing those trades that the si system dictates every single time in the future. And that's, uh, unfortunately, that's sort of the key. Yeah. Could, could the same be said about 
people who buy index funds, that they buy, you know, the same process, so to speak? Could that be argued? The reason I ask is that uh, I saw an article, uh, I think actually it was uh, John Bogle himself, the founder and inventor of index funds who were out in Wall Street Journal talking about how um, at you know, I think nowadays it's something like seventeen percent of all U.S. equities are held by these index funds, and uh, if this rate continues, it's going to double in in a few years. So, so there is this real um, prospect of having you know thirty, forty percent of all votes in U.S. public companies owned by just a very few number of big um, institutional. Uh, investors, uh, i.e. The, these index funds, and that's clearly going to change um, the landscape maybe. Um, so, you know, that's hence I asked the question. I mean, could, could, could people ar argue that, well, we have our process, but, you know, index funds are exactly the same? I hope so. I want them to have that conclusion that the S&P is sort of like a systematic approach, mm -hmm. our opinion, not a good one. It's long only and maybe not accrued uh, rules based on sure. market cap. But I definitely think that's the takeaway for me. This is not a victory for uh, stocks or stocks only, long only. It's a victory or passive. It's a victory for systems and process and it's really sad that even something as bad, the rule, as bad as the S and P process, the S and P rules, it still beats most managers more than likely because their process is more discretionary. Yeah. Plus, I mean, as, and, it's and, and the other thing, there. yeah, and and the other thing that obviously you've mentioned many times, Jerry, um, is that, you know, one of the reasons why we think it's bad, it's an 8% strategy with a 50% plus drawdown in the long run. And that's obviously very different from the kind of strategies that um, uh, that we operate and, and, um, and the CTA space in, in, in general. So, uh, yeah. Any other good tweets um, you want to share? I guess my favorite of the week was on a really nice new paper talking about the going back a little bit further than what is typically shown about the returns of the stock market and going back bef in the um, before 1926, I think is the point he was making is that if you look beyond that before that, in the 1800s and early 1900s, you see a few 30 year periods where stocks lost money, and it doesn't look nearly as obvious that um, buy and hold is a good idea. Uh, and uh, so that was his um, long paper, but, um, and my takeaway was, you know, history is not a good guide of what we should expect. The history of returns um, is not something I think we can oh, rely upon in the future. And we, we like to rely upon a back test that generates thousands of trades with our entry, exit, stop loss systems. And whenever we see something uh, that doesn't fit into that model of historically back-tested trades, a robust sample size of trades that you should be able to rely upon in the future, we should say something. And we should say, yeah, this is not something I can buy into uh, because it doesn't fit what I know to be correct. And yet we're more likely to say, Oh, can you give me? That's a great portfolio. Can I have five percent of that as well to off to give you some diversification? So, I think we need to believe what we believe a little stronger, and that was sort of what I was really firing myself up over the, this past week when I read that article. That you know we had nothing to apologize for except not being more upfront about what we believe is the truth, and. Uh, even I'll hedge and say, you know, uh, maybe maybe there is this equity premium. Maybe being long stocks is fantastic and it needs a, the, the permanent place in your portfolio. But uh, looking at a lot of historical data and charts prior to maybe more of a cherry picked period that most uh, people who are in business to make money by being long equities, uh, that period that they use, that, you know, was 
pretty much a pass for uh, buy and hold as a panacea. I think maybe we need to relook at that and um, and, and be a, a big advocates for what we think we know better. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that, you know, this whole thing about, you know, the historic perspective is very important. I mean, another another way to, to look at these things is that uh, it's really just also related to the time or the, the you know, the year you got started in in the financial industry can really shape your, um, your mindset uh, about investing for, you know, maybe even for the rest of your career. I mean, people who, um, you know, came interestingly enough i guess myself included i mean i started in the financial industry uh, in 1987 just prior to the crash and i think when i think back uh, on my own career i probably have been a bit more uh, you know risk averse in, in in my view because that was a very sobering experience to uh, to see that so early on in 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 your career and uh, and and i've heard that from other people that you know how, how you know the time they start um, it has really shaped their their view about things. In fact, I had a meeting um, not too long ago. I think it was earlier this year with someone who were managing a lot of money uh, actually, and uh, and he said, to be perfectly honest, I started in this industry in two thousand and eight, um, and pretty much since then CTAs haven't done that well. So that's why I'm not, you know, I'm not super bullish about uh, these things. And um, but he admitted at least that's just because he had a very you know, narrow um, sort of 10 year perspective of the industry, completely ignoring um, what had, you know, what had gone on um, prior to that. So, yeah. Any comments, Moritz, from you or do you want to yeah, like, jump into some questions? I like that article a lot. Um, and uh, I wasn't surprised by the results. I mean, when you, uh, my thoughts on that were, okay, so we're, we all have only that one life. We're not going to get out of this life, right? And most of us have 30, 40, 50, maybe if you're very lucky, 60 years of, of an investing lifetime. I mean, most people, if they don't inherit large amounts of money, they'll be 25, maybe 30 before they have some money to even put in the stock market that's meaningful and then maybe hold it there for 30 years, long only passive, if that's what you want to do. So you're really talking about that, say, 30, 40 year corridor. And in the past, there have been so many periods where a long only buy and hold approach with even the best stocks hasn't worked. And and remember those charts that are in that paper, they're without fees, they're without taxes, they're without all the, like your behavioral biases of, you know, taking money out, freaking out in the downtown, uh, in a drawdown and becoming, you know, um, too optimistic in a, in a bull market and taking the money off. So very likely you're going to be even worse off then the charts shown there. And then I reflected on that and say, well, you know, you could be starting to invest in a, in a real bit, uh, in a bad point in time. It's, it's such a, such a strong function of the timing. And then I look back on CTA performance. Now we cannot look back on CTA performance since the 1850s. There's no track record on that. And Neil's uh, the done track record is one of the, the longest out there, if not the longest, but when you compare that, you, you just don't have that same pattern in a systematic trend following strategy, whatever 30 or 20 year period or 10 year period you take, right? Yes, it's what did we just hear? It's bursty. Fine. I take that and episodic. Great. But a 10 year or 20 year um, negative period that's just up and down and not yielding you any money. I haven't seen that. So really just reinforcing um, the philosophy you know, don't, I'm just speaking for myself, don't do passive long only equities, start with trend following. And if you must add long only equities to that, but not the other way around. I think that's very eloquently said. And I like the idea of having now to uh, go out and talk to investors about them investing in episodic performance. I think that's a great, uh, that's a great tagline. Um, questions, we have a couple coming in uh, this week, which I think we should uh, we should tell, by the way, before I get about 100 emails asking what the name of that paper is we've been talking about, can any one of you sh just share where, um, where, where we found it? Or who's the author? Uh, yeah, it's called Stock Market Charts You Never Saw. And um, it is by a professor emeritus um, 
Let me just see. I need to open that. Sure, no, that's fine. Take your time. Edward um, Edward Macquarie. Okay. So stock, stock market, market charts, charts you never saw. So, okay. I'm sure people will enjoy that paper as well. Um, so the first question this week is from Patrick. Patrick is on our side of the table in the industry. So he uh, has a question here. He starts out by very kindly um, commenting on our podcast, which we appreciate, Patrick. I'm going to jump to the question. Um, he's saying, I'm hoping that your insights and experience can help answer a question that none of our peers in the CTA allocators we have access to have been able to do in a language that traditional finance stocks and bonds professional can understand. We have a large investor that suddenly raises their concerns that the US dollar notional value of the portfolio in their calculations is approximately 10 times that of their investment in the managed account. Now, for us CTA managers, this is a this is a red herring, and we understand it provides little information about the actual risk in the portfolio. Uh, it's got to the point where they are convinced the entire industry doesn't calculate risk properly. Almost everyone I do have approached uh, about this ridiculous assertion comes from trading backgrounds where the notion of stops are well understood and their answer to me is simply, well, that's the way managed futures work. Uh, what is uh, what is ever a question, uh, was this ever, sorry about this, Patrick, was this ever a question um, that you thought about and do you ever get these kind of questions from potential investors? What is evidently so obvious to us after 15 years in the game is actually very difficult to prove beyond doubt to the non-believers. So thanks for that, Patrick. Let me um, let me kick it over to uh, to uh, you, Jerry, and and Moritz to give your initial thoughts about this. How do we explain the fact that our positions are on a notional basis much larger than the amounts investors have invested with us? How do we best explain that? Well, the first thing is I would not approach that type of a question uh, the way he did. I would, um, it's not beyond, it's not, uh, it's not, it's my responsibility to give them a good answer, and it's a great question. Every question is a great question, and I need to defend it and not uh, this is the way we do it and that sort of stuff. No, um, figure out a good answer. It doesn't sound like that he had one. Uh, so it may not be an answer that is acceptable, but uh, it could be honest and clear. And so we uh, trade a lot of markets that have very low volatility. I mean, in a nutshell, you know, that's what it's all about. Some of the markets don't move a great deal, the interest rates and maybe the currencies. So the short-term interest rates as well. And uh, <clears throat> so we have to trade those larger in sort of uh, risk parity per position, let's say, and normal. Mm -hmm. We're trying to put trades on that are going to have the same uh, volatility. You know, my silver position is going to move up on average about as much as my soybean position, which moves about the same amount as my McDonald's position. So something like that. It's... It's, it's a great strategy. It does, uh, you know, it's not perfect. Uh, the uh, can just be too much leverage and that's a problem. And then um, I have lived through situations where sizing these positions based upon the recent volatility failed miserably because the new volatility was sky high. So, you know, just be honest, there's pros and cons. We're not perfect. We have, we've tried a broad, diversified a group of markets and we our money management allows us to maximize that diversification by trading them uh, based upon their volatility mm, yeah what are your thoughts uh, Moritz what's the best way to help investors understand the difference between sort of the notional account value and the you know X times uh, quote unquote leverage uh, that all these strategies uh, have and the fact that maybe that's not a complete uh, reflection of the actual risk uh, within the portfolio. Very incomplete reflection of the risk. Um, all of what Jerry said is true, obviously. I don't look at that number too much. I calculate it, so I have that available. But, you know, bear in mind, most people, um, they calculate what is called the gross notional exposure, which means they don't net things out, which is fine. I, I don't think netting things out is a good idea either. 
But when you uh, calculate the notional exposure and you take the absolute sum of all individual exposure levels, so you may have even, you know, highly correlated markets, which at the same time, you know, one market you're long, the other one you're short, and you just double that, you kind of like you sum that up. Uh, you have all those low vol markets, like the short term interest rates that give you a lot of notional exposure. So I don't think at the end of the day that that number um, can really give you as an investor any meaningful guidance with regard to the risk in the portfolio. It is, of course, in in a rough way correlated to your margin to equity and those type of things. So it gives you a feel for the vol and the exposure overall that you're running. But it's not a good, in my opinion, not a good measure for risk. Right. Which... <laughs> I guess also, of course, is, is Patrick's point. And I think, Patrick, just to, to uh, add um, from my side, I mean, we do get this question, but we defend it uh, exactly as, as Jerry and, and Moritz said. It's not a very useful measurement um, as such, but I think it is up to us as managers to try and maybe visualize it in some ways with some examples um, and just show the difference uh, because some of these short-term contracts, for example, short-term interest rates obviously have huge notional exposure, but also maybe just explain that it's very hard to to really um, even compare the notional contract value of, uh, you know, of crude oil or, or live, you know, uh, live cattle with, uh, you know, an, a financial instrument like, you know, the German Bund or the U.S. Treasury. So that's also where it becomes uh, less meaningful. But of course, it depends. Do you use stops? Do you use uh, value risk approaches? And that's another uh, factor. So I think in your particular case, you probably need to, to just, um, you know, uh, be as transparent as possible and, and maybe try and come up with some creative way of visualizing the, the true risk uh, that you run in, in your portfolio. But thank you for the for the question, Patrick. Um, let's jump to another question um, from Brian. And Brian has sent in questions before, so we appreciate that. Um, he wants to, um, well, he asked a little bit about drawdowns, uh, which is, of course, very apropos this year. Um, and uh, the question is as follows. Are drawdowns caused by a growing subset of the portfolio's allocations hitting their stops when those markets go against the positions? I'd be curious to hear in your fine podcast if there are different market and portfolio scenarios that can lead to drawdowns. Um, so, uh, Moritz, do you want to give your view on on that in terms of what what can cause drawdowns? Wow, many many different market conditions. I'd say you know you can think about. The market conditions we all hate: choppy markets, sideway markets, up and down, but no direction. Getting whips out all the time, like uh, dying to death by a thousand paper cuts kind of way. Um, you know, if that goes on for a long time, that can produce a very meaningful drawdown. As can very abrupt reversals, um, the nature of which we've, I think, just seen in, in October in the equities this year. Um, very quick uh, moves to the downside. Um, you've been long, maybe, maybe uh, highly long. Uh, long in all the markets, all the equity markets, and then boom, they drop, um, causing you a large loss. Then you stop out, maybe reverse the position. Then markets turn around again. You're losing on that reversal. You're stopping that out again, and and so on and so forth. So many different uh, opportunities to lose money. Um, shocks to the market, like we've seen in 2015, where all of a sudden the Swiss franc um, uh, appreciated. Um, severely wasn't a problem for me, but I think for many others, it probably was, and I, and I, know, I know it was just, you just never know. It's, it's, uh, all the possibilities are out there to lose money. So control your risk. Um, always be aware of the fact that something bad can happen the next day. Um, don't be overexposed. Don't be too leveraged. Stay the course. I just want to intersect something here, um, and maybe before, we, if you have any comments, Jerry, but I just wanted to intersect something here for you, Brian. It, drawdowns in itself doesn't necessarily mean you lost money on the trade. I mean, if, for example, you have a lot of open profits, um, and let's just say it's the end of a month, and you, you, know, you have a positive uh, performance across your portfolio, 
Now, if some of those positions then reverse, and, and let's say in this case you're using a strategy that does use a stop, your stop might actually be, uh, you know, in a better um, place compared to your entry point. So on the trade itself, you may get stopped out, or you may get stopped out with a profit, but still going to show up as a drawdown because you had a month that ended with a lot of open profit. So I just want to be you know, preface the, the, this uh, by saying that, you know, a drawdown doesn't necessarily mean that you lost money on the trade. It just means that, you know, the trade is being exited at a lower or a worse point than your last monthly, you, you know, um, um, performance calculations uh, as, as such. Um, so just want to add that. Anything on your side you want to add, uh, Jerry? Let me think this, this is one of my favorite subjects. I think uh, not only uh, just continuing what you said is uh, you may have the biggest drawdown of all of your trading friends on this particular trade, but you may have also made the most amount of money, uh, not due to the leverage either. Uh, your stop loss was longer term. Uh, your trailing stop was longer term, and uh, everyone else got out and got back in halfway up, two thirds of the way up. You stayed strong. You traded a longer term strategy and you made more money, but your drawdown was larger. And so what? It's it's still about making money, I think, uh, you know, in a risk adjusted way and splitting up uh, the two equity curves, the closed trade equity, the cash plus the realized profits and losses, um, I think is, is a good way to also to look at uh, as compared that to the total equity or the open trade equity. You know, I think uh, the, CT, the typical trend following system uh, is going to be very concerned with these small losses and an optimal stop loss placement, not too close, not too far away. Uh, we don't want to take frequent uh, losses, capital losses, get out with the loss uh, to eat into the capital. You know, this is, um, we don't like to do that. Uh, but then on the other hand, if we're long crude, with a nice profit and uh, the back test we like in our system and what the back test says, and it's, it says uh, be long-term and hang in there. You're going to get some mega profits. Then I oh, would we'll be much more liberal with that particular trade and, you know, lose quote unquote more on a profitable trade from the peak to the exit uh, than we would on uh, the stop loss. So I think looking at these philosophically a little bit different, uh, being bold with profits and cowardly with losses is what uh, trend following is all about and lumping it all into um, drawdown or loss. And it just drives me crazy when uh, a giving back a profit is characterized as a loss uh, <laughs> because it's, it's just a way to get uh, wrong on your, on your trading philosophy, or it's a way to, um, to mischaracterize it on purpose that, uh, you know, when fall targeting has to kick in and all sorts of, in my opinion, non-robust ways, you know, we've made this money, we've made money in natural gas, we cannot afford to give any of it back, uh, and it's yours and you deserve it, and I'm going to figure out a way to make profits, make big profits, and keep these big profits, and, which is impossible. So you can't really have it both ways. Um, really, it's a great topic. We could spend a lot of time on this, I think. Yeah. Yes, and I'm sure we will going forward. Um, in fact, I was listening to, uh, I think it was Patrick O'Shaughnessy's uh, podcast, um, which uh, has some really great episodes uh, on it. Um, and, and, and I can't remember who the guest uh, was, but uh, they, uh, they talked about performance and, and all of these things. And, uh, and, you know, how meaningless it really is to look at performance on a month by month basis. I mean, even a year by year basis, is not really that meaningful. Um, and, you know, not until you get past five years, um, you know, will performance in general be, will have some meaning. It's like similar to look at equities, um, you know, and, and their, you know, you know, ac accounts being, you know, published every three months. I mean, it's completely meaningless uh, in a company that makes, you know, five, 10 year plans to, to judge them on uh, a single quarter. Uh, so, uh, and of course, we know that our strategies are very, very popular, like private equity, uh, where people get the impression that, oh, this is much less risky because look at the drawdowns. Well, 
let's not forget that for the most part they make up their own mark to market and uh, you don't have, they don't have to have a mark to market like we do with public prices they they can make their own prices to to some extent and and that makes it look like a very safe strategy with low vol and and decent returns um but um can't really compare those uh, uh, in my opinion so appreciate uh, your thoughts and appreciate your question, uh, Brian. And as always, uh, if you have more questions out there, we, uh, we, we're, we find them good, interesting. It's a way for us to gauge what um, the real concerns and questions are. And uh, since we're here to try and, and, and educate and, and spread the, the uh, knowledge about um, these strategies, your questions play an important role in doing that. So do please send them to info at toptradersunplugged.com or tweet them to Jerry uh, or myself or Moritz and we will find time to um, to talk about them during these uh, conversations. Um, we may have a few other things. I don't know before uh, we get to that point. Let me just bring you up to speed um, with performance for the industries um, that we track or I should say indices that we track. Uh, again, these numbers are from Thursday evening. So that's not the end of the month. It's the day before the end of the month. Um, so maybe they improved a little bit on Friday. I have a suspicion they may have. Uh, but in any event, the B top 50 index, which by the way, uh, for people who may not know, it's not really the 50 largest uh, managers. It's probably more like the 20 largest managers who are still open to new investments and provide daily returns. So the beta 50 index uh, was down about a quarter percent for the month, down 5.17 for the year. The Sukgen CTA index uh, down 1.43 for the month, down 7.5 for the year. Sukgen trend index down 2.19 for the month and down 9.37 for the year. And the Sokgen C uh, short-term traders index down 1.67 for the month and down uh, 1.64 uh, for the year. And then the bridge alternative index uh, is down 2.36 for the month and down 10.29 for the year. So, Jerry Moritz, any final thoughts? Anything that you got inspired uh, to share um, through our conversation today? Happy trading. Looking forward to a green December. <laughs> yeah, why not green December? That that would be a good hashtag. Yeah, I mean, uh, Chesapeake made uh, thirty percent uh, in December nineteen ninety uh, due to a heating oil. Let's do that again. Yeah, so I think uh, and thirty yeah. percent for the year. So it was all one trade heating oil, one month go. for the entire yeah. year. So I don't think it's going to happen like that. I'll take you know, five, five or six. That'll be nice. But, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think we would all like that uh, to end the year. And, uh, you know, as as we've talked about earlier, it's really during these difficult times that uh, it is the most interesting to consider these strategies um, and any other strategy that has been struggling um, for the strategic asset allocations as you look into 2019. So anyways, on that note, uh, we're going to wrap up this week's uh, conversation, which, of course, we hope you've enjoyed it. And um, certainly we enjoyed it a lot uh, and making them for you. And um, if you do take some value away from these, do share them with your followers. And uh, we are, of course, always internally grateful for a, a good rating and review. Most importantly, an honest rating and review in iTunes. It really does help other investors discover the Systematic Investor Series. From Jerry Moritz and me, thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.